this stuff. Yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna talk about that? Yeah. You're, you're okay. No, I know. I, I'm going to use the sun. That's all set. Thanks, Leo. Um, good morning. <coughs> thank you all for <coughs> thank you all for uh, showing up this morning. Um, <coughs> so uh, the story today is uh, <coughs> kind of a, it's a soft matter, liquid crystal. Uh, <coughs> story has lots of uh, kind of connections to different things, different aspects of soft matter, uh, <coughs> theory and experiment. Um, it's something that uh, <coughs> we sort of stumbled upon uh, <coughs> hacking around at the frontiers of science, I guess you could say. Um, <coughs> so. This is a collaboration between <coughs> our group and, and that of, uh, of Tommaso Bellini in Milan. Um, <coughs> see Greg and <coughs> Greg Smith's here in the audience. So uh, <coughs> if you uh, want to talk to somebody or ask questions, uh, he'll be around and I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss. Uh, <coughs> His experiments with you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with uh, <clears throat> with this this timeline. So this is from uh, a paper by <clears throat> Jerry Joyce uh, <clears throat> entitled "The Antiquity of RNA <clears throat> Antiquity of RNA Based Evolution." Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is kind of a history of life on Earth. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> you know, there's a timeline, you know, it, it's sort of open to some, some questions as to the, you know, the exact, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, within a half a billion or half, <clears throat> half a billion years, maybe, or something like that. But it's kind of, 
established by the observation of, of cellular, actual living cells 3.5 billion years ago, and then what must have sort of happened before that. <clears throat> um, so, and it's sandwiched by the, the, <clears throat> form, the, the time of the formation of the Earth. Um, so the kind of transition into actual biology is, uh, <clears throat> is considered to, uh, to <clears throat> have happened in, in what's called the RNA world. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we'll talk about that briefly. So uh, this is kind of the current, you know, I would say dogma in terms of the of <clears throat> the appearance of life on Earth, um, and <clears throat> uh, the RNA world is a concept that actually started in, in Colorado in the mid-1980s mid um, <clears throat> with the work of Tom Check. And um, it's important because I think biologists really believe that if you could get to the point of an RNA world, then, <clears throat> that, then biology would actually start, could really start from that, okay? <clears throat> So that's uh, <clears throat> the importance of the RNA world. So let's discuss that a little bit. So uh, on this scenario, you have <clears throat> this uh, era of prebiotic chemistry. Actually, this keeps going all along here. Uh, <clears throat> so these are meant to sort of represent small molecules. And so uh, <clears throat> prebiotic chemistry sort of looks something like this. This is a uh, a scenario that's uh, <clears throat> worked out by one of the kind of leading guys in this field, uh, showing that uh, you can get molecular fragments that are <clears throat> needed to make proteins, lipids, and uh, nucleic acids from a <clears throat> kind of a generic chemical pathway that uh, uses hydrogen cyanide as its uh, sort of <clears throat> kind of principal uh, component. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are various pathways here that, uh, that lead to, uh, for example, this is a, uh, <clears throat> an amino acid, uh, this is a, a nucleobase, uh, <clears throat> and there are li also lipid components. So this is kind of small molecule organic chemistry that, you know, might happen in a, <clears throat> in a sort of a concentrated a uh, solution that has light shining on it, that has cycles of temperature change, cycles of hydration and dehydration. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of the, <clears throat> the, the, the starting scenario. Okay, so then <clears throat> the RNA world. So the RNA world is based on uh, <clears throat> this molecule RNA, uh, <clears throat> which, is, which is a polymer, okay? So it's a homopolymer in the sense that it has a backbone <clears throat> that is repetitive. Uh, <clears throat> it's a heteropolymer in the sense that uh, each element in this backbone has uh, a side group. It's called a base. And there are a family of these side groups. Um, <clears throat> in, in evolved DNA and RNA, there are, uh, <clears throat> there are four different bases that dominate the activity of DNA, uh, <clears throat> A, T, and then G and C, and then RNA, uh, <clears throat> A, G, C, and then uh, uridine, which is a, <clears throat> a, sort of similar to uh, thymine. So uh, <clears throat> the, the, ac the biological activity of, of of the nucleic acids is based on their ability to, uh, <clears throat> to base pair, that is uh, selectively hydrogen bond to, <clears throat> uh, for these bases to selectively hydrogen bond to, to one another. Um, <clears throat> A to T, G to C. So this is a, a, a you know, so <clears throat> what it means is that C and G are just more sticky 
mutually sticky than, for example, G and T would be, or C and A. So A and T are, this pair is more sticky, and this pair is more sticky. The difference is a few kT. <clears throat> but in a, in a chain where you have many of these base pairings going on, then the, <clears throat> the, that extra stickiness uh, <clears throat> leads to uh, the <clears throat> possibility of making very strongly bound pairs of these chains. Okay, so this is duplex <clears throat> DNA. So um, <clears throat> this actual <clears throat> molecule is, uh, <clears throat> is made from, uh, a, 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 in this case, a self-complementary pair. So you have a single, a single molecule. So if you look at <clears throat> this chain, there's some fairly specific properties that it has. So the backbone chain is polar. So you can tell which way you're going along the chain. <clears throat> So uh, one end is called the five prime end, and the other end is called the three prime end. And when these <clears throat> chains pair up, uh, they actually, so if you have, for example, this sequence of bases, and you <clears throat> want to make a duplex DNA, uh, <clears throat> then the other chain is, is flipped over in terms of this polarity direction. And for this choice, <clears throat> Of, of base sequence, CG, CG, AAT, 4As, 4T, CG, CG, if we take this thing and flip it over, then uh, it's self-complementary. That is, you have a, 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 a complementary base pair at every place along this chain. So this will form a, a duplex DNA. Now, if we made this with RNA, we would also get the, exactly the same, almost the same kind of a duplex. So DNA and RNA have very similar, uh, <clears throat> very similar binding properties. Actually, the difference between DNA and RNA is this <clears throat> hydroxyl on the sugar ring. So uh, <clears throat> this is the, sorry, the two or three prime position. So it has a hydroxyl. Uh, in DNA deoxy ribonuclease, this oxygen is missing. There's no, <coughs> there's no hydroxyl here. That's the difference between RNA and DNA. It's a small difference. <clears throat> okay, so um, what else to say about these? So <coughs> you can, uh, you can <coughs> look at, at these bases and you can see that uh, they're like, uh, <coughs> kind of little aromatic sheets. They tend to be uh, <clears throat> with these, these rings. So these are aromatic rings. Um, so if you looked at that, the prebiotic small molecule chemistry, a lot of it uh, has to do with making these kinds of, of ring structures. And actual, in actuality, if you, if you start with sort of simple molecules like carbon dioxide, water, uh, hydrogen cyanide and add UV illumination, then there's a natural tendency to <clears throat> to form these kinds of rings. And then that keeps going and going and going. And so eventually what you end up with is asphalt. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the sort of origin of life issues is why didn't everything end up just as asphalt? Um, okay, so uh, <clears throat> this chain, if you take just this, this single RNA chain, uh, it's a polymer, it's quite flexible. It has a, a persistence length that is in solution, an average straight section is only about one base long. Um, but when, the, when these molecules pair up, to form this sort of three-dimensional structure, then they get much more rigid, okay? And that's important for <clears throat> the living crystal formation. So in a duplex, the persistence length is about uh, <clears throat> 150 base pairs, just 500 nanometers. So they're a kind of a rigid <clears throat> but semi-flexible polymer. 
mm, just a base or two. <clears throat> so you can see that this is this these chains deposited on a surface. You can see that because of this rigidity, they they're they're making a little crystal in two dimensions <clears throat> here. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So what happens in the RNA world? So so DNA. <clears throat> In, in, in biology is used to transmit information. So uh, you have a sequence, you want to <clears throat> say duplicate that sequence. So you, you, you start off with, with a chain and then you have a machine that will go along this chain and, <clears throat> and make this sort of complementary pair. So you can transmit <clears throat> information in, in, in this sequence. RNA on the other hand, <clears throat> is generally <coughs> used in, uh, <coughs> generally has, have sequences that have, have, have parts that are complementary. Um, <coughs> so in this drawing, so the, you know, the little steps are here, you have complementary sequences. But <coughs> uh, it's not just making just a straight complementary rod, it builds a, a three-dimensional structure. Um, so these are some, some typical kind of, of, of geometries you get. And so the structure is such that uh, you, you get certain geometries of, of the bases, for example, in the places that are not complementary. So in this RNA, you have this little section here. So <clears throat> this actually is two, this is two molecules of RNA. There's, there's this one going, going down and then up, and then there's the other one that crosses and comes around. So the one that crosses and comes around, <clears throat> uh, if it happens, so happens that this other section comes along and, and pairs with it um, <clears throat> and uh, then forms this structure, what happens is that that second chain that came along ends up getting cut, chemically cleaved. So this <clears throat> structure has, is a catalyst. It has a catalytic effect of, of cleaving this piece of RNA. So RNAs have uh, <clears throat> a whole, f f so this was discovered by Tom Check here in the in mid 1980s and so this immediately sort of led to the realization that that RNA <clears throat> or that nucleic acids are not only information carriers but they're also they're also catalytic so <clears throat> now you have a family of molecules that have this sort of com combination of of um <clears throat> Of, of base pairing and sort of sequence selectivity combined with the ability to do chemistry. This is the basis of the, of the RNA world. So the RNA world is viewed as a, <clears throat> as a, as a collection of molecules like this, which are, um, <clears throat> are sort of, sort of joining themselves together and breaking themselves apart in, in, uh, in ways that are governed by their, uh, <clears throat> their structure, which in terms is, is governed by their, their base pairing. So they're controlling both their, uh, <clears throat> you know, the kind of this overall population, but then that's reflected in, in uh, <clears throat> these base sequences that will evolve. Okay, so that's the RNA world in a nutshell. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, <clears throat> if you look at Jerry Joyce's time, Jerry Joyce's timeline, there's this kind of <clears throat> the pre, the sort of small molecule era. <clears throat> um, so the most, and that's going on all the time. This kind of the, is the supply of these molecular fragments, and then there's the, <clears throat> then there's um, the uh, RNA world over here. Then the question is, you know, what happens in between? So you can see that the, the chemistry in this small molecule part is very completely different from what happens in the RNA world. Okay. So basically, we have the chicken and the egg problem reduced to, you know, to the RNA world. So 
you know, why would you bother making RNA if you weren't, if you didn't have an RNA world? On the other hand, uh, <coughs> if you want to have an RNA world, then where are you going to get the RNA? Okay, so, um, <coughs> so, <coughs> so our story has to do with the what Jerry Joyce called the pre-RNA world. That is, you know, how do you where where do these these sort of homopolymers come from? Um, <coughs> you you can't make a molecule this like this accidentally. It's not going to come from from accidental chemistry. Okay, so something uh, <coughs> something different has to happen. All right, so um, <clears throat> if you go back to the RNA world, um, what you and you compare it to the prebiotic, just the small molecule chemistry era, then <clears throat> what you have here that you don't have there are these these three <clears throat> features. So you have molecular selection, uh, which <clears throat> Um, and you have molecular synthesis, so you so this is so this selection is a form of, of replication. You have catalysis, which makes the necessary reactions very efficient, and then you have you have feedback. So uh, doing chemistry on these chains makes a new sort of population of chains available, and they in turn control what goes on. So uh, selection, catalysis, and feedback. If you have a molecular system that, that has these three things going on, then it interestingly begins to look like life. Okay, so you have to ask the question is what is life? So we're not, you know, we're not really uh, <clears throat> trying to do that. Um, <clears throat> what's the purpose of life? That's more uh, <clears throat> a more interesting question. And if you have a system that that's doing this, then um, <clears throat> it, it at least looks like it has a purpose. <clears throat> okay. All right, so um, I mean, when we started this project, we didn't know any of this stuff. So uh, <clears throat> we didn't get into this sort of thinking about the origin of life. So we were just thinking about soft matter physics. All right, so <clears throat> let's go through the, so, so then let me start with what we actually did, and, and this story starts um, uh, in the 1950s with this <clears throat> cast of characters that I suppose that uh, most of you are familiar with. Um, so Francis Crick and James Watson, Maurice Wilkins, Rosalind Franklin. So um, <clears throat> they were all at the Cavendish Lab uh, <clears throat> or around thereabouts in Cambridge. Um, so <clears throat> And they were, Wilkins and Franklin were X-ray crystallographers studying uh, <clears throat> bio, biomolecules. Rosalind Franklin was the sort of the uh, leader in that field. Um, <clears throat> Maurice Wilkins was her supervisor, although not really. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Francis Crick and, and James Watson were uh, well, Crick, Crick, they were both biophysicists, and they were interested in the structure of DNA. All right, so the, the chemical structure of DNA was known, and it was known that DNA was a, was a genetic material. So you could sort of transfer mutations from populations of cells by taking the DNA out of one bunch of cells and putting it in another bunch of cells. Then, then the same mutation showed up in the second bunch of cells. Um, but the geometrical structure of the, of the molecule was not known. And uh, <clears throat> so that was the, 
kind of the challenge of the day. And uh, <clears throat> so Watson and Crick were model builders. They were taking the geometrical structure of, of the, this chemical compound and trying to, <clears throat> to uh, you know, make arrangements. Uh, <clears throat> Franklin was doing X-ray diffraction on single domains of, of, of DNA. So they would uh, <clears throat> extract uh, <clears throat> DNA from, for example, salmon sperm or calf, calf, calf thymus. Uh, and uh, so she would, <clears throat> she would hydrate the DNA. And then, uh, so it's like, kind of like snot and you, and then pull fibers. Okay, then, <clears throat> and then she would pull, she pulled many, many, many fibers and kept them hydrated. Then she put them all together. So she had kind of a, 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 a millimeter diameter sort of column of oriented DNA. And then she did X-ray diffraction on that. And uh, <clears throat> so she got images like this, this is you know more or less what the sample looked like. She got images like this when it was dried out, and images like this when it was <clears throat> was hydrated. Um, <clears throat> so one day, <clears throat> uh, Watson went over to visit Rosalind Franklin. They didn't get along very well, actually, and uh, <clears throat> eventually, she sort of uh, <clears throat> invited him to leave. Um, on the way out, he went <clears throat> and had a chat with Maurice Wilkins, and uh, <clears throat> Maurice Wilkins happened to show James Watson uh, <clears throat> several of, of Rosalind's X-ray images. Now, Rosalind was interested in the in the dehydrated DNA because it had a lot more structure. Uh, <clears throat> Watson happened to see the X-ray scattering pattern of hydrated DNA, much simpler. Uh, <clears throat> so he committed this to memory. Francis Crick was, <clears throat> uh, one of his research topics was uh, calculating the X-ray structure of, of helical polymers. That's because proteins had turned, turned out to have a, the alpha helix structure and had been recently discovered. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> Watson said, well, this is what it looked like. Uh, <clears throat> Crick said, ah, I think I know what that means. And two weeks later, they had the structure of, Watson and Crick had the structure of DNA. Um, <clears throat> so Watson, Crick, and Wilkins won Nobel Prizes. Rosalind Franklin passed away because of X-ray exposure <clears throat> before the Nobel Prizes were awarded. So she probably would have won one also. OK, so but <clears throat> the difference between these two images is that uh, <clears throat> in a dehydrated form, this, it, these things arranged in a crystal. In the hydrated form, it's like this. The molecules are free to sort of slide up and down with respect to one another. So this is a columnar oligocrystal phase. This X-ray pattern is essentially the pattern of a single DNA molecule. And uh, sort of you can see all the features of this structure in the X-ray scattering. So you know, the periodicity of the base stacking gives these two spots these oblique <coughs> lines, which you can just uh, <clears throat> think of as, as a lattice in this direction, give these, you know, the, the X patterns. And uh, basically, this is all you need to uh, <clears throat> to get this structure. Now you notice that the if I if the, the, that there's a kind of a narrow gap and a large gap and a narrow gap and a large gap. <clears throat> That's because uh, one of these chains, as I said, the chains are polar. One's pointing down, the other one's pointing up. That gives this thing uh, a C2 symmetry. Okay. So since that time, it was known that. DNA forms uh, liquid crystals. Um, <clears throat> there are even some organisms that are that have this liquid crystal structure uh, in in vivo. Uh, but basically, <clears throat> you have uh, 
pneumatic phases. So this is a, a solution of 50 nanometer long DNA. That's about 150 base pairs. Uh, again, this is almost a rigid rod because of the stiffness of that, that chain. Uh, so this is basically a, a, a packing of these, of these rods. The other feature that I, I failed to mention here is that, uh, <clears throat> that these molecules are chiral. So the ring has several chiral carbons. So tetrahedrally, tetrahedrally bonded carbons with something different on each, on each vertex. So this molecule is inherently handed. So the DNA double helix, for example, always comes out with the same, uh, same helicity. And it's a basic and sort of fundamental question about <clears throat> the origin of life as to you know, how and when this chirality was adopted. Okay, so <clears throat> we have pneumatic phases, and then we also have columnar phases. So in a columnar phase, these, these chains are packed on a lattice, hexagonal lattice, but again, they can slide past each other, so you can form structures like this, for example, which is a <clears throat> kind of, <clears throat> the, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a columnar uh, conformal, uh, <clears throat> defect in if you have these things in a texture then the texture has this characteristic appearance which sort of tells you that that this is what's going on locally so we have pneumatic and columnar phases <clears throat> right so <clears throat> um so we're packing rods uh, there's a lot of no a lot known about the the pack the liquid crystal behavior of of packed rods. So these are, <clears throat> this is a simulation uh, of uh, hard sphero cylinders, things like this, where the variable the variables are the length, the, the, the anisotropy of this thing, and uh, the constant volume fraction. So <clears throat> if you make them anisotropic enough, so this is 146 base pair DNA, then uh, you have isotropic pneumatic uh, and uh, columnar phases, and then at higher concentration, crystal phase. And this <clears throat> isotropic pneumatic phase was discovered by Onsager in the 1940s. Uh, so this is a trade-off between orientational and translational entropy. So you have these rods, you imagine the rods sort of sweeping out disks, and if you increase the concentration to where these disks overlap, then <clears throat> the packing, or the, there's, there's more space available to the molecules if they, you, you know, more translational space <clears throat> available if they orientationally order. So you get a trade-off of loss of orientational entropy for enhanced translational entropy, and you get a little crystal phase. Um, okay, so this is more or less what you would expect for these solutions of, of DNA. So this is the actual, <coughs> actual phase diagram uh, data uh, <coughs> going down to about uh, 100 base pair along, uh, <coughs> along DNA. Um, so this is the phase coexistence between the isotropic and the pneumatic phase. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> in a solution like, like this, you can imagine either getting, say, above the pneumatic, a smectic phase, where these things are standing up and would just all get into layers. Or you can get a columnar phase, where they, they go into stacks. Okay. Now, what you get depends on polydispersity. So, um, if you, if they're, if they're polydispersed, sorry. Oops. If they're polydispersed in length, 
Okay, they could be polydispersed in length or they could be polydispersed in, in diameter. Suppose they're polydispersed in length, then, then what should you get? The kilometer phases, right. So if they're polydispersed in length, then, <clears throat> then sort of putting them in layers doesn't buy you doesn't buy you very much so because they they can still sort of stick into the next layer and that sort of jams things up so <clears throat> if they're poly dispersed in length then they'll tend to go in the kilometer phase so that's what happens <clears throat> in DNA um, another interesting feature of, <clears throat> of this phase diagram is that uh, <clears throat> If you want to get a nomadic phase, then uh, you have to have a certain amount of rigidity. So a couple of simulations. This is by Robin Selinger and, and Robin Winsma. Um, so they looked at, at hard rods that were infinitely long. Um, but with a finite flexibility. So uh, if the rods are sufficiently rigid, you get isotropic pneumatic columnar phase. But below uh, uh, persistence length, that's about 10 times the, the, the diameter. If it becomes shorter than that, then, uh, then the pneumatic phase goes away. So to get a pneumatic, you have to have a certain degree of rigidity. You can always get a columnar by cramming things together. <clears throat> okay. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, one day we wondered <clears throat> how short can you make you know one of these 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 double helixes and still get a little crystal phase. So that was kind of the start of this, this, this story for us. Um, <clears throat> I should point out that the, the whole origin of life business is, is, is viewed as, as a chemical problem. You know, the focus is the chemistry. Um, <clears throat> there's no field of origin of life materials. So this is an origin of life materials story. <clears throat> All right. so. How short can you make uh, duplex DNA and still get Lewy crystals? So that was the question. All right, so <clears throat> um, we started with this molecule, <clears throat> the Dickerson dodecamer, so that's the sequence. So it's self-complementary uh, and makes this, this short duplex. It's 20, 20 angstroms in diameter and about 60 angstroms long. Um, this is actually the first of these DNAs that was crystallized so that they could do the three-dimensional X-ray crystallography and prove the, the, uh, <clears throat> the Watson-Crick structure. All right, so then that's here in the phase diagram. Uh, <clears throat> and as it turned out, uh, <clears throat> this stuff has, has pneumatic and columnar phases. So... <clears throat> So down here, we're getting uh, liquid crystals. So this is in the regime where if you just had the Ansager steric interactions, it would have to be isotropic. <clears throat> okay, so then this is 10 base pairs. That's a little shorter. Uh, pneumatic and columnar and a more ordered columnar and then some you know, crystal phase. So the <clears throat> this is the pneumatic. So you have these these, these, this pneumatic director, but the molecules are chiral. So on a large scale, this director precesses like in a colosteric liquid crystal. And uh, in these short oligomers, this pitch for the precession can be in the visible. So you get these uh, <coughs> reflection, you know, the, the Bragg reflection uh, colors. Okay, so this shows a series of self-complementary duplexes uh, with Luger crystals down to uh, down to six base pairs. <clears throat> okay, so 
this just shows kind of the, the shapes of these things. Um, <clears throat> all right, so then this is what we ended up with in this first set of experiments in terms of a phase diagram. So uh, <clears throat> in these short oligomers, we have isotropic, pneumatic, and, and columnar phases. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> the vertical scale here is concentration in migs per mil. So 1,800, that's 100% DNA. That's neat DNA. So at 900, we're at 50% volume fraction. <clears throat> this is a little bit higher concentration than the DNA guys are usually interested in working out. Um, <clears throat> So you get these phases, but at, you know, at quite high concentration. <clears throat> but being materials guys, that didn't bother us too much, except that it makes, it makes these experiments really, uh, <clears throat> in the beginning anyway, it was really kind of expensive. So we're, using, we're used to working with small amounts of, of material in crystals, but, uh, <clears throat> but these, these, these custom DNAs uh, even now are like, a million dollars a gram. So a milligram is a thousand dollars. So if you want to do, say, con you know, experiments of phase behavior as a function of concentration, then you need to find a way of, of, um, <clears throat> of making a little bit of the crystal material go a long way. So, uh, for example, we <clears throat> were found a way of of slowly dehydrating these things and so you can get concentration in, in a single cell, uh, <clears throat> different concentrations. So this is columnar in the pneumatic phase with the pitch changing as a function of concentration. And then <clears throat> using interferometry to measure the refractive index to get the, to get the actual DNA concentration. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, <clears throat> So these, uh, you know, we were able to, for example, for different lengths measure the phase diagram uh, <clears throat> as a function of temperature. So as you go up in temperature, these phases will melt. They'll <clears throat> become, become isotropic. So you have a, a first order phase transition. Uh, <clears throat> and then as you make them shorter, you have to go to lower temperature. So uh, the, the uh, like pneumatic columnar phase transition is below room temperature in the, in, in the short guys. All right, so then <clears throat> the basic question is why are we getting these phases where Onsager says, <clears throat> says there won't be any? And uh, the reason is, is, well, it was alluded to in, in Oleg's talk when he, he discussed chromonic crystals. Uh, <clears throat> So the reason is that these, these short duplexes are adhesive at the end. So they, the end of the DNA has the last base exposed. This is a little oily sheet. Uh, so if two of these get near each other, what happens is that uh, the, uh, the water will get expelled and then they'll stick together, okay? So there's a, an end-to-end -end adhesion of these short duplexes. Okay, so the scenario then is that if you have, a, a, say, a pair, a, you know, a short oligomer, um, and it, it can duplex, then it'll make a little duplex, and so then this little duplex looks like this with a hydrophobic <coughs> patch on the end. So that induces aggregation into these linear stacks, and then <clears throat> eventually the stacks will become anisotropic enough to make a little crystal. <clears throat> okay, so it's a it's it's like <clears throat> starting from the single bases. It's a one, two, <clears throat> three, and then if you count the texture, sort of a four-stage self-assembly process. <clears throat> okay. So then there are various 
ways of testing this. We can do computer simulation. Uh, <coughs> Matt Glazer and uh, <coughs> Tatiana Korblova. Uh, <coughs> actually, this, the, the, the living, the, these kinds of simulations go back to Judy Hertzfeld about 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, this is sort of <coughs> set up to to mimic our, our DNA system, but uh, this is an example of, of living polymerization where you have polymers that are formed by this <coughs> stacking association. Um, so you end up with a phase diagram that <coughs> looks like this, where this vertical axis is this the strength of the uh, of the adhesion. So again, that has to be, you have a minimum kind of <coughs> uh, adhesion if you want to get a pneumatic phase. So that kind of promotes the, the um, stiffness of these, of these aggregates. Uh, <coughs> at, at lower stacking, you can just sort of, again, cram them together to get a, uh, to get a columnar phase. Um, <coughs> So you can sort of look at this, the, 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 the physics of this association and uh, <coughs> from, the, uh, <coughs> from, the, from the actual, say, pneumatic columnar phase transition, uh, work out what the average aggregate length is and what the uh, what the, the stacking energies are <coughs> of in, in the in the, in this aggregation okay so um, so it looks from this that that you have uh, <coughs> in this in this scenario you have a selectivity of of uh, <coughs> of molecules for two things. One is they have to be able to duplex and then they have to be able to do this, this stacking. And so then we looked at <coughs> uh, a lot of different uh, variations of this to see how, how selective uh, this, this hierarchical, uh, <coughs> sort of this hierarchical uh, assembly was for different molecular characteristics. So you can change the, uh, the, the, the terminal groups on these chains. You can put non-pairing tails on. So you end up with a thing that looks like this with, with these short tails that don't pair up with each other. So this suppresses the crystal ordering. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, you could put pairing tails that enhances the crystal ordering. Um, so something like this uh, <coughs> doesn't make these these liquid crystal phases. Uh, <coughs> you can you can put defects in, so sequences that don't pair. And <coughs> uh, we've sort of gone to extreme situations in this, as I'll get to in a minute, but. The basic story is that if if they pair if they pair at the ends, then they make little crystals. <clears throat> if they if they don't pair at the ends, then that tends to suppress little crystal ordering. So this stacking depends uh, sort of critically on what's going on at the end of these <clears throat> at the end of these chains. And then you can make um, you can have these blunt end stacks which I've just been describing, or you can have stacks where uh, they overlap. So these, are, these give stronger coupling. These tend to have <coughs> wider range of crystal phases. I'll go into the, the details of that. Now this just shows the pneumatic phase <coughs> in, uh, in this tenmer as a function of concentration. So this, the helix pitch of the, the chiral pneumatic depends <coughs> on the proximity of these columns. And uh, so we've done uh, <coughs> a lot of work on just trying to understand that. Um, 
And then we're pushing down to lower <coughs> to shorter oligomers. These are former, these are <coughs> uh, formers that, uh, that are overlapping. Uh, so they <coughs> have uh, some nice little crystal phases. Um, <coughs> And then RNA, so you can make self-complementary RNA. Uh, basically, it <clears throat> has slightly lower symmetry helix because the, the bases are not, as in DNA, perpendicular to the axis of the helix. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, they uh, behave in a very similar way to the, uh, <clears throat> to the uh, DNA. Now, if you take just the guanine base, then uh, guanine is able to hydrogen bond into <coughs> these, these tetramers. So the other bases only bond hydrogen bond in pairs, but the guanine can form these things. <coughs> so these end up uh, <coughs> making these tetramers, which are very insoluble, but <coughs> uh, and because of that, will form chromonic stacks even as as single bases. So this shows that uh, if you have an object that's that's hydrogen bonding strongly enough and and large enough that uh, you should be able to to make stacks with single bases. So we're not quite there yet with the duplex DNA, but <clears throat> um, it looks like it's possible anyway. All right, so that's kind of the the first part of the story, just discovering these nano DNA crystals and, and trying to understand <coughs> uh, their behavior. Okay, so then um, <coughs> in this sort of exploration of, of different uh, <coughs> uh, base pairing scenarios, we we went to uh, <coughs> oligomers that were complementary. But mutually complementary, but not self-complementary. So we have A and B that that match where the bases are are matching and 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 base pairing, uh, but these things will not bind to themselves. Okay, they'll only mutually um, <clears throat> pair. All right. So this is the self-complementary scenario that I started off with. So they're all the same molecule. You <coughs> have them isotropic in solution. You cool down, they form duplexes here. Then the duplexes aggregate and you get a little crystal. All right, so um, <coughs> in this scenario uh, of the, a the, the AB mixtures, you have a very similar thing. <coughs> uh, they're single strands at high temperature. You cool, they you know, they <coughs> find mates. Uh, if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, then everyone has a mate and uh, eventually end up with the ligand crystal phase. <coughs> okay, but if you do the same experiment with, with a <coughs> uh, concentration ratio that's not one-to-one, -one, so here it's one-to-ten, for example, um, <coughs> then you have a, <coughs> you have a, many yellows, a few greens, you cool down. The greens all find mates, but now there's a lot of extra yellows that can't, that, that can't pair up. So they remain in solution. All right, so then the, <clears throat> the duplexes that are paired condense into a little crystal droplet, and <clears throat> the unpaired ones uh, <clears throat> are basically expelled from that droplet. They're in, in solution. So you end up with this. All right, so you've, <clears throat> by this Lewy crystal phase separation, you, you can physically separate out all of the complementary duplexes. So this hierarchical self-assembly selects for complementarity. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> sort of, you know, the, the, you have these little domains that light up between cross polarizer and analyzer, which are like, you know, little beacons of, of, complementar of, of complementarity. And the same thing works with, with RNA. <clears throat> so 
so then you can make sort of mixtures of many different things, some of which are complementary, and, and then the same thing will happen. Um, <clears throat> so if you actually look at the concentration of, <clears throat> of, uh, of chains in, in, in say, in, in the circumstance where you have a condensed droplet and chains outside, it's the, the, the concentrations are not that much different, maybe you know, 20% different or something lower outside, for example. So <clears throat> this is an example of a, a, a phase separation that's uh, <clears throat> produced by depletion. So the, the duplex chains aggregated end up forming these rigid structures. The single chains outside are flexible. So the single chains act as, <clears throat> as a depletant, basically concentrating the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, these, the, 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 <clears throat> the, the rigid, uh, the rigid aggregates. So, uh, I think this depletion interaction has been mentioned already. So this is the situation where you have these, <clears throat> these flexible chains that, that are sort of expelled from something comparable to the radius of gyration. Uh, from the edges of these rigid objects. Uh, <clears throat> if you try to push them closer, then that costs entropy. Uh, <clears throat> so if you have two rigid objects, if they're removed from in between, then the, these expulsion regions can overlap, and that effectively makes more space available for the, uh, <clears throat> for the flexible chains. Okay, good idea. Um, I think the the real only real evidence is kind of the footprint of of you know these kind of different catalytic modes that you know you can find in different RNAs. I mean it's it's like that. There's no uh, like geological evidence for it or anything like that. And is it? I guess it's kind of. A mediating step to sort of like structure and function kind of thing. And we don't have any other examples of that. Because you wouldn't expect proteins to just sort of come out of nowhere, would you? To have the information for them first, but then a kind of a mediator between that and the structural function. Well, there's still this meta is you know meta metabolism first or information first yeah, sort yeah. of Yeah, so I didn't know I don't know the status of and I don't know, I guess my feeling is that they probably came together some, right. somehow. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise it's just a chicken and egg problem. But I, the RNA world has gotten a lot of tra traction, I would say. Okay, yeah. Okay. Like 8,000 papers on it. Although I'm a lot clearer about what the Lua crystal world is going to be doing than just doing than the RNA world. I mean, but in the RNA world, you're getting more, much more, much deeper into uh, you know chemical biology and biochemistry. You know, it really is, does look like a uh, chemical problem then. I think, although there must be obviously. <coughs> Physical organization, you know, associated with it, but I, I you know, that that's that's pretty open. 
what that is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> we end up with this this phase separation of of, of you know, of these kind of rigid assemblies and the single and the single chains. So another um, kind of theoretical description of that is this uh, <clears throat> this really beautiful paper by Paul Flory. Uh, <clears throat> so just the two-dimensional lattice of sites that are occupied or not, and but they have to be occupied either by rods, so rows of occupied sites which can't you know which are repulsive they can't overlap or the same sort of s chains but where they're completely flexible they can just go zigzagging around in a random walk all right so in that simulation you <coughs> you end up with uh, these you know th solvent rods random coils you end up with complete f phase separation of the rigid things and the flexible things which <clears throat> which is, you know, what we see here in this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, first order phase transition. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> so we were writing up this this uh, nano DNA work, and uh, then <clears throat> uh, looking at these these pictures and <clears throat> that we were making and sort of came to the following uh, sort of realization. So we have a collection of, of molecules, and if, you know, if they have the right stuff, then they can duplex and stack and phase separate. And so you get this little crystal phase. But now suppose that you make the, the ends of these things chemically reactive. So that um, you know, so that you can you can do a reaction where the green will stick to will be chemically bonded to bond to the to the red. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then in these stacks you have a situation like this. The stacks kind of set you up for for this reaction. So they put the green guys and the red guys right next to each other in this end-to-end -end situation. So just from the law of mass action, that strongly pushes <clears throat> forward the, this ligation reaction. So, and we're not talking about biological enzymatic ligation, so we're talking about prebiotic or abiotic li <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> ligation. So, uh, <clears throat> so the Luga crystal 
ordering selects molecules and sort of puts them in, in these columns. And if you could then take advantage of that and do ligation, then what you would end up with starting from this, then you would end up with that. So, and each one of these sections is complementary. So you end up with a longer complementary molecule, okay? But we know from our phase diagram that longer molecules <coughs> stabilize the liquid crystal phase. Okay, so you have the liquid crystal here that <coughs> is selecting molecules. And <coughs> if, if this thing would work, then it would be promoting ligation, <coughs> which would be making longer complementary molecules, which would be stabilizing the liquid crystal phase. Okay, so now you have this situation of selection <coughs> and feedback and um, <coughs> the third thing, right? <coughs> so it's just well, so <coughs> this is just a simple mechanism for for starting with short complementary chains and making them longer that, as I say, it has these three features that, you know, make it look like life. You could say, what's the purpose of this? Well, it's to make liquid crystal. <clears throat> right, so there was this, well, I have a slide at the end. It says, you know, there was an era in the you know, evolution where the sole purpose of life was to make liquid crystals. Okay, so that's okay. So, so then the question is, <clears throat> you know, can well, you know, can we actually do this? Yeah, I'm not a hundred percent convinced of that, but I mean, I would say it looks pretty promising. All right, so. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Well, again, to get this to get this phase separation, you're talking about 500 mg per mil, so it's like 30% by volume. But we envision scenarios like this to play out in situations where you know you have hydration and dehydration, so things you know are dissolved, but then they dry out. In the drying out process, the concentrations just go way up. So you have hydration, dehydration, and you have temperature cycling. <clears throat> well, okay, so that, yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, kind of, now that becomes a chemistry problem, you know, that becomes a chemistry problem. So, yeah, you have to, to you know, check that and know that. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so so we get pneumatic phase. We, you know, we actually we get pneumatic phases in here. So it says that in actuality, these, these um, <clears throat> the stacks, the the aggregated stacks are almost as rigid as the just the fully covalently linked DNA. You can sort of, <clears throat> if you if we go back to the uh, to the phase diagram, it's kind of interesting. Sorry. <clears throat> So you can see that we go from eight base pairs to 16, for example. This melting temperature goes from 40 to 70 centigrade, which means it's going, you know, it's changing very little in kelvins. Now, if the thing were like two rigid sticks that had one, one pair has got eight links and the other pair has got 16 links and they were all rigid, then the transition temperature would be proportional to the length in kelvins. But here it hardly changes in kelvins, which means that in these, 
in in this polymer, you know, the individual bases are sort of going together and coming apart almost entirely on their own. There's only a weak cooperativity from you know between the adjacent bases. There's some, but it's not really strong. So um, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> and so then this stacking link, you know, the stacking energy is is very comparable to this you know, with the, sort of this association energy in the covalent, in the covalent thing. So, <clears throat> um, right, so these assemblies are, are, I think, are quite rigid. All right, so then we set out to, uh, <clears throat> to see if <clears throat> this would work. But now we start, you know, thinking of this origin of light context, context we, <clears throat> We did some other experiments. So one, I mean, if you start out from uh, just these 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 chains, I mean, the information content starts out basically zero. Information has no meaning. So the question is, if you start out with random sequence DNA, can you can you get liver crystal ordering? So we'll. <coughs> Will this sort of scenario emerge in a in a population of of chains that has no sort of sequential information? <clears throat> and the answer to that is yes. So uh, <clears throat> this is uh, these are ran <clears throat> This is a, a solution of random twenties showing a <clears throat> a columnar phase. So <clears throat> what happens is that. <clears throat> In a population of random DNA, every molecule has a perfect pair, has some perfect pairs, but <clears throat> it actually can never find them. There are so few of them. But if you put mismatches in, then you have, you have more possible mates. So the number of mates goes up with the number of mismatches, <clears throat> but if you put in too many, many mismatches, then there's not enough sticking energy for the, the pair to, to last. So there's a kind of an optimum um, an optimum uh, overlap, <clears throat> which sort of maximizes the product of the number at times the the lifetime of the of the pairs, and it has something like in a twenty or roughly ten uh, ten <clears throat> sequences of ten that that pair. So these phase separate and uh, and. <clears throat> have tails that are sticky enough to make these linear aggregates and they stack. So, um, so this, these little crystal domains are kind of, comp there's this complementarity emerging in a, in a uh, <clears throat> mixture of, of, of random sequences. You find that, for example, you can make random sequences that are always shorter. You can make shorter ones if, if the ends are always complementary, for example, then they have Lewy crystal phases. Um, <clears throat> if you make these things longer than 20, then what happens is that the ends become stickier and stickier, and then the thing makes a three-dimensional isotropic gel. <clears throat> so, so complementary can emerge just from, from randomness. <clears throat> Uh, through this mechanism. So that was uh, kind of an encouraging result. All right, so then, <clears throat> so then we went on to, uh, to <clears throat> uh, look for, for this ligation and <clears throat> we're able to show that this actually works. So, so this is the, uh, <clears throat> the system. So you have um, the <clears throat> this, Water soluble carbodiimide, carbodiimide EDC. Uh, you have uh, these chains which have the native terminus, so a phosphate on one end and a an hydroxyl on the other end. Uh, so then this molecule in solution uh, will, with, with a pair of chains, with this phosphate on one end, hydroxyl, so this. Uh, does this coupling uh, reaction? So, links it, it it makes a native native link <coughs> in in this chain, uh, and then has isourea as a uh, 
as a byproduct. Um, so we started doing experiments with, uh, for example, <clears throat> this is a, just a blunt stacking thing that makes, makes liquid crystals, mixed it with EDC. Um, <clears throat> we got, we got <clears throat> some ligation. The problem was that the, as you increase the EDC concentration, it suppressed the liquid crystal ordering. Um, so, <clears throat> so then that, uh, that slowed us down for a while, but then eventually we figured out that uh, we could use this sort of this depletion, another depletion trick, and that is mix into the solutions uh, <clears throat> PEG, which is a water-soluble polymer that's used to condense out, uh, <clears throat> condense out DNA. So this, uh, condenses out the, the DNA into droplets and then gives a large reservoir where we can uh, put in the, the EDC at whatever concentration <coughs> we want. And uh, so uh, this <coughs> then showed a very substantial uh, <coughs> increase in in the so okay so then you you know you you mix this up you let it set for 24 hours and then you uh, you dissolve everything and then use gel electrophoresis to measure the length of the uh, <clears throat> of the oligomers that you have at the end and uh, you start out initially with just these these short ones and then as time goes on if the ligation is working you end up with with longer ones. Now, the problem with this is that there's a very big difference in the concentration of, of the, the, the DNA between these two situations. So you, you would expect this to be a lot more effective. <clears throat> but then we found that um, <clears throat> with this PEG depletant, we could generate a situation where either thermally, we could thermally, in this condensed state, we could melt the, the, uh, the Lewy crystal phase and, you know, maintain the, these, these condensed droplets. So then we have a situation where these two things have essentially the same density. One is isotropic, one is Lewy crystal, <coughs> and uh, the Lewy crystal is is hugely more effective at at uh, at producing uh, ligation. So we end up with with uh, <clears throat> sort of detectable ligamers out to, to like twenty times the uh, twenty <clears throat> sort of twenty of these uh, twelve more things linked up. So a couple hundred base pairs. All right. So this means that we're able to generate. Uh, in RNA, we would be able to generate um, uh, <clears throat> sort of ribozyme, you know, catalytic RNA length oligomers starting from, in this case, uh, 12 mers. <clears throat> okay, so basically this looks something like this. You have this PEG solution outside. Uh, <clears throat> here you have a, a condensed Lewy crystal drop. Now this this is a mixture of 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 two oligomers. <clears throat> so there's this the D two TTP. So this has the the TT tail. So this does not the, the, this suppresses liquid crystal ordering. This stuff stays isotropic. This forms a liquid crystal. So you have <clears throat> within this phase separated drop, you have a phase separation of the <clears throat> of the um, of the blunt end guys making a little crystal phase and uh, and the the <clears throat> guys with the tails staying in the isotropic so you can react this phase separate these things in the centrifuge and then <clears throat> and then look at the composition of the different uh, phases after you um <clears throat> have run the reaction. All right, and so this is what we see as a potential scenario for filling in this gap between the small molecule 
sort of single bay synthesis and the RNA world. <clears throat> and so a scenario where you have these crystal domains basically making, <clears throat> you know, making long um, <clears throat> uh, RNA chains long enough to, you know, to participate in the RNA world. Uh, <clears throat> so the crystal selects molecules out of this sort of, <clears throat> you know, available population of small molecules. Um, and then <clears throat> this, re of course, requires having some, some chemistry around that will do ligation, uh, but <clears throat> selects molecules with, with that will we'll ligate them, sort of act as a, a feedstock for the, uh, <clears throat> for the RNA world. Okay. Right. So that's our notion. <clears throat> okay. So now, so sure. Why did it stop, it? stop trading with the crystal? Ah. Uh, Well, if you <clears throat> if you just make complementary strands, then um, you'd end up with these kind of rod-shaped aggregates, and I think that would be a dead end. But <clears throat> if, for example, you 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 know you you have <clears throat> uh, just enough complementarity to to get the little crystal, and then you do the ligation, all right, and then you melt, then you end up with these strands that are <clears throat> that are complementary in some places and not in others. So these are the things that fold up into these reactive units. I mean, a chain, the the you know <clears throat> if you if you dissolve the chain, then then the thing that's always closest to it is itself, right? So it you know it finds itself. It finds a way to, if it has complementarity, it finds a way to fold up. So then these these chains are reactive. So then <clears throat> at high concentration, then then the picture is that you know they would start these these reaction cycles, which you know which would then you know pull apart some chains and put together some other chains, that kind of process will lead to a kind of a narrowing of the population and, you know, some definite act activity as long as it has, you know, an energy supply. So, uh, I'm thinking that it still controls a batch of concentration. Uh, after, after giving it some time, well, that's what we hope to be able to show. I mean, you know, we're, I mean, so now we have this 12 mer and we can make these long, so we can make a, you know, a pot that just cycles and you keep putting in 12 mers and you'll get out these longer chains. Okay, so <clears throat> then I think we'll introduce random, I guess the next envisioned experiment is to introduce randomness and then uh, see if coming out will be uh, will change with some catalytic activity. So, for example, putting into the solution uh, <clears throat> some molecular chain, maybe with fluorescent fluorescent groups at the two ends that are quenched as long as it's you know intact. But then, you know, if <clears throat> if something coming out is catalytic enough to break it, then you would get fluorescence. Some simple experiment like that. <clears throat> I'm going to change the topic a little bit now. All right, so this whole, <clears throat> the whole discussion up to now was with RNA as we know it, which is, I said, is a chiral molecule. So there's a lot of discussion and controversy in the origin of life community about 
when chirality showed up and or how it showed up and um, <clears throat> so initially there were chiral molecules but <clears throat> globally a system like this would have been would have been achiral uh, <clears throat> I mean a mixture of left and right in the end though biology ended up choosing one over the other okay so um, there's a lot you can learn about this in liquid crystals and there's been some really interesting recent work on this which I'll just sort of touch on in the last however many minutes I have five minutes okay um, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> There's a Nature article about by Mike McBride entitled, <clears throat> uh, you know, did the did life grind to a start? Did life grind to a start? Okay, <clears throat> so it was about this experiment. So, uh, <clears throat> pardon? Did life grind to a start? Okay, so here I'll um, yeah. All right, so <clears throat> uh, this is a sodium chlorate crystal. It's a simple salt, but it forms chiral crystals. Okay, so if you have a single crystal of this, you see optical rotation. Now, <clears throat> if you just grow these crystals from solution, uh, <clears throat> there's no inherent chirality here. So some of them will be left handed, some of them will be right handed. So these are conglomerate domains in, in the chemical parlance. One will rotate light clockwise, the other one will rotate light counterclockwise. <clears throat> All right, so if you have this stuff in solution, then you can, you know, you can supersaturate it, and then you can grow a solution of, <clears throat> of crystals. You know, some will be left, some will be right. <clears throat> okay, now if you stir that solution <clears throat> for a couple of days, then they'll all end up one way or the other. Sometimes they'll all end up right, and then other times they'll all end up left. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> well, the crystals encounter each other when you stir. I mean, if they're just in solution, then maybe they're, they're in some Brownian motion. But if you stir them, then they're forced to sort of, forced to collide with each other. Okay, <clears throat> so now in these, in these collisions, you have the opportunity or the, you know, the instance where, where <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, first in this solution, uh, in, you know, on average, there is many left and is right, but in a given solution, there will be you know statistical fluctuations. There may be more of one than the other, um, and in the um, you know in these collisions, there's the opportunity to sort of transfer <coughs> handedness. Now, I think Oleg <coughs> does the word, name Frank mean anything? Frank elasticity. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> so actually, so, can I ask, so these are, you're saying they're, you know, they're chiral structures that yield enough that they could, or the degrees of freedom are yield enough that they could, the barriers are small enough that they can, when they collide, they could convert from one chirality to another. Right. Together. Yeah. Exactly. Sort of the statistical uh, predominance of one over the other is the nucleus to have it all convert to one. Yeah. Okay, then a corollary to that experiment is you take, you have this solution of left and right crystals. Okay, then you just, you dry it out. So now you have, you know, a dry powder of these left and right crystals. Okay, so then you put in glass balls and you grind it. Then you end up all with one hand in this. All left or all right. <clears throat> so that's why the question was, did life grind to a start? Okay, so. Right, yeah, exactly. So it's the same mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> Which? Oh, well, no, I mean, this, I mean, this just kind of, 
is an argument that life started out achiral, but you know then by you know this kind of statistical fluctuation, one hand in this just took over. So Charles Frank, he he wrote one bio-related paper and it was about this problem, and he showed that <coughs> say uh, let's see, right system of entities that both copy themselves and destroy their mirror image. An initial random event that provides a tiny excess of one hand would necessarily lead to the exclusive occurrence of that form, <clears throat> even if mirror image versions could also form randomly. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> so, um, you know, <clears throat> this sort of, is the uh, <clears throat> you know he you know, built a simple model that that demonstrated this, and he was sort of pessimistic about there ever being a laboratory example of this. But <clears throat> um, it turns out that uh, <clears throat> that this is a very nice one. And n another recent <clears throat> one is that you have these actually actual chiral molecules that. That can inter that you can interconvert. They can flip handedness. Um, so, so does that mean so if you had a magnet with you know with uh, you know up and down is completely symmetric, and then you quite you know that they went through the transition to experiment, if you have roughly equal number of domains up and down. Domains. Right. And you know if the magnetization is not conserved. Then you know the grinding or mixing or the right. would you know domain wall would sweep through and the dominant domain would take over either up or down. Right. So I think if you had some non-equilibrium process that you were like flipping the magnets, right. right? That you could you could generate you would that that the system would tend to go to to either all up or all right. down. That's but if you have a model where the dynamics conserves magnetization. If MZ is conserved, then you would never do Right, that. exactly. But this, but chirality is not conserved, right? I mean. Well, if the world is, uh, if, if underlying laws of physics are a chiral, then it's. Yeah, but then there's. Right. Okay. Uh, right. I'd like to go one direction. So the, the weak interactions are, is life chiral because of the weak interaction? Yes, I don't know. That's the question. I mean, but I, I mean, actual calculations of that. Of you know how that could have happened, just always end up with it being so such a weak effect that I don't think there's any a credible you know calculation that shows how that could happen. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So um, let me just take <clears throat> another minute here. So uh, this kind of spontaneous. Chirality is also a feature <coughs> of Luger crystals. So if you if you take uh, bent molecules like these guys, they make smectic phase. So they make they organize into layers, and because of this bend, the layers are polar. They all get pointing in one direction, <coughs> and then if you have these tails, then <coughs> then they tilt. So you can think of a phase transition where at high temperature, they'd be standing up, and you cool down, and then they tilt over. So once they become polar and tilted, then they're chiral. So you have a direction pointing this way, and I'm with, my hand tells me which way they tilt. So <clears throat> these these things are spontaneously chiral. Um, and if you make a smectic, then <clears throat> you can have well, you can have a binary choice of polarization direction and a binary choice of tilt direction. So <clears throat> if they all point in the same direction and tilt in the same direction, then that's macroscopically chiral. If they <clears throat> point in the same direction and tilt in opposite directions, then that's macroscopically racemic on average, not chiral. <clears throat> um, then they can alternate in polarization, uh, <clears throat> or they can <clears throat> alternate in, in uh, yeah, polarization and tilt, or just in polarization. So there are four possible 
phases that can come from a stacking of layers with you know with these this characteristic <clears throat> okay so if you <clears throat> make a cell out of this stuff and put on an electric field okay this is a cell where the the layers are standing up <clears throat> so we're visualizing the orientation of the molecules the tilt direction this way or that way the electric field is going in and out of the <clears throat> the board changing sign I don't know if I'm going to be able to start this thing again. Okay. Okay, so then you see some places where there seem to be these brushes rotating. And here they're rotating in opposite directions. So those are the chiral, those are chiral. Where you where you have just the stripes coming in and out. <clears throat> like here. <clears throat> that's that's an achiral phase. Okay. So The two phases are um, are this one. The this is this is the one just with the stripes, <clears throat> and then this one. This is the one uh, where if you put the field out, it all ends up like this. If you put the field in, it all ends up like that. So you get these these brush rotations. <clears throat> so you can see this chirality just as a kind of a macroscopic. Uh, <clears throat> manifestation, um, you see that there are sort of phase boundaries between these different domains. So these are stable phases uh, that <clears throat> spontaneously have uh, <clears throat> have different chirality. Um, now, if you look, <clears throat> if you look at these layers. Um, <clears throat> Molecules are tilted and bent. So, what that <coughs> ends up doing is um, you have a structure like this. So, <coughs> tilted and the layers are bent. So, if you look down on this thing, then the top half of the layer, say, is going north and south. The bottom half of the layer is tilted in a direction that's east and west. So the top half of the layer stretches one way, the bottom half of the layer stretches in a different direction. So if you let that go, then <clears throat> each little section of the layer pops into a saddle splay. Um, <clears throat> that's chiral. Okay, so <clears throat> if you make a phase out of this stuff and some of these materials, <clears throat> the layers have to be saddle splayed everywhere. So they can't get flat. So <clears throat> they make a three dimensional structure that's disordered, but everywhere there's a layer. Everywhere the layers are chiral, <clears throat> and the chirality propagates along, the, la along the, the layer directions. So you end up with a structure that's macroscopically <clears throat> phase separated. It's optically isotropic, but has domains that are left-handed and, and right-handed. So you get a macroscopic chiral phase separation um, in a fluid phase where the chirality is the only, uh, is the only broken symmetry. So uh, there are some fairly exotic manifestations of this kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And, in liquor crystals. I think with that I'll just uh, stop. <clears throat>
but if you make the you know the mirror image, then it's, it smells like peppermint. So I mean, you can't flip within the context that's been chosen. You know, the relative chirality of each molecule is important. But if the whole thing went to the other way, I don't think it would be any different. No, I think it's just energy. Yeah, so I mean, in these, actually, the first paper on these stirring experiments, the claim was that if I stirred it this way, I got left handed. Oh, if I stirred it that way, I got right handed. But that turned out not to be right. <laughs> it was just the stirring. You know, I think in principle, like you have the conglomerate of domains. In principle, you know, these, you know, the domain walls have extra energy, right? There's some, there's a line tension in the domain. So in principle, this thing can be, this thing wants to sort of curve down. You know, in principle, this thing can just uh, end up thermally in a single, you know, in a single it's just kinetic barrier. It's just a, you know, there's a kinetic barrier that's sticking. You don't need, you don't need outside energy to anneal to a single animus in this, in this, in this, in this kind of a situation. I think we're telling us about the definition and get to this with chirality. It's not like a single number left, right? The center, and it has to do with, you know, it actually depends on aspect ratio and what aspect you're looking at. Yeah, he was talking about, I mean, he was talking about these things, right? He had this little... Yeah, this, for example, so you think of, on one hand, you know, if, if you grow this direction, you call it a, along this axis, it's right-handed, but oh, if you grow this direction, right. all of a sudden it's... It's exactly the same thing. But the molecules, just look at this, you would have, you know, you could have either of those points, but here are the molecules. <coughs> yeah, but I guess I wanted to ask more, like, kind of a, even abstracting away from these specific things. People have, if, if that's been tested experimentally, where, uh, you know, if you prop, let's say you have some chiral material, you know, you, you propagate light along one direction, it rotates clockwise, and you propagate along some other axis, it rotates it rotates. Yeah, well, no, that's, that's definitely true. That's definitely true? Yeah. Wow. You had a single crystal, right? You had a different optical rotation. So it was, you know, well, yeah, it had. So you really can measure it's the... It's a So you really can measure the ten chiral tensor that uh, we talked about. The optic, you know, you, yeah, so you can measure the optic. Right, and it's that. It and it could have depend, a single it would e depend on frequency and all. You know. It can be, have opposite chirality depending on frequency and direction. Yeah. to go for an exam. I have to take her down to call, you know, yeah, she was. Um, so just to follow up the question, uh, oh, if I could ask another question. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, with a random driving course, it definitely wouldn't conserve virality. Like, you wouldn't impose conservation of virality as a constraint just right. because it's not conserved. So, uh, eventually, like, um, there's an equal chance of getting one chirality over uh, the other. Let's say. Um, and so, uh, with the main, like, time scale, you said by, like, local interactions between the molecules, or... Yeah, I mean, I guess you could just think of it as, you know, as the... I mean, I guess it would have to be that the boundaries, you know, sort of the boundaries between the different chiralities would have to be, you know, cost more energy somehow. And then, you know, this driving force is just um, kind of, you know, it's moving them and effectively break, you know, just breaking down the, you know, the, the, the barriers that are kind of, you know, sticking them. It's like a phase, it's like a phase separation. Okay, so you start off with some phase separation between two different uh, groups. Yeah. And, uh, and that, did you also say that you don't actually need an external driving force at times to get, uh, like, predominance of one phase over the other? No, I mean, I... And that could come from just the shape of the... Uh, Right, there's a Luga crystal system uh, like the one that I showed, but I mean, it's at a higher temperature, so you end up with these conglomerate, you end up with the two, it's isotropic cubic crystals. You end up with the two domains with sort of perfectly smooth domain walls. And if you just let the thing set, then they gradually, you know, Relax. Relax and disappear. But uh, so, so are the other conditions where the domain walls couldn't relax, like yeah. So they, you know, like in this the, the situation I showed, they're just very, you know, <clears throat> the domain walls are just very stick. You know, they're kind of stuck. And they have like pinning sites. Uh, what causes the pinning sites? Well, like in the, the in this picture I showed, you, you know, of these complicated layers, right? So you'd have, you know, you have some boundary. Here it's here the layers are all left-handed, and then you know here the layers are right-handed. All right, so now you have, you know, this this okay, very nice this, this texture of layering, you know that you know like some places. The, the main wall just can't go, can't move smoothly. 